This was an absolutely epic week for uranium. So much to get through, so much news. First of all, the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF jumped 9% over the last week, which is huge for an ETF. That means a lot of the underlying stocks did even better. You have an old favorite like Energy Fuels UUU jumping 31% on the week. Let's get into what moved this market. First of all, the elephant in the room is the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust stacking pounds of yellow cake on the week. Just a massive increase from Sprott moving these pounds off of the market because supply is shrinking while demand is skyrocketing. And let's talk about some of that demand. First of all, you have this article from Bloomberg, China's climate goals hinge on $440 billion nuclear. So they're investing huge amounts of capital into nuclear, planning at least 150 new reactors in the next 15 years, more than the rest of the world has built in the past 35. So think about demand now versus China bringing online 150 new reactors in the future. That's going to bring a whole lot of demand for this resource over the next decade. So it just kind of makes it seem like even an even better long-term story than it already was. It's going to cost them $440 billion. They are investing for the long-term in this. And part of why they're doing this is what we've discussed before. Here we have slower winds and low rainfall have led to lower than expected supply from Europe's dams and wind farms, worsening the crisis. And expensive coal and natural gas have led to power curbs at factories in China and India. Nuclear power plants have remained stalwart. An energy consultant said nuclear is the one energy source that came out of this looking like a champion. It generated the whole time. It was clean. The price didn't change. If the case for nuclear power wasn't already strong, it's a lot stronger now. So you have, again, like we've talked about, the narrative shifting. But one thing I love about this particular article is Rick Rule's comment. Rick Rule, the incredible well-known investor, wrote, in the near term, right, this is a long-term play. It's going to take them decades to build these out, but they will want to shore up their supply. So China will want to shore up their supply of uranium in order to fuel these reactors in the future. So they're strategically already planning to acquire and make claims to strategic uranium reserves around the world. And so that is going to be another driving factor. That demand is going to take even more supply off the market in the near term and the long term. But I love Rick Rule's comment on this article saying in the near term, focus on the rate of Japanese restarts, which we talked about and how impactful that is. 33 nuclear reactors that were shuttered are going to come back online. Rick Rule writes, these plants don't need to be permitted, financed, or built. So Rick is excited about the short-term catalyst from Japan that we've already talked about, but it's good to see that he is excited about that as well. So I talked about energy fuels in the beginning, and just to come back to that, because a lot of people have energy fuels, it's a really popular company in the US, if not the only major producer of uranium in the US. This is why it jumped. The head of its third quarter report, analysts had forecast that energy fuels would report a two cent per share loss on sales of 700K. As it turned out, though, energy fuels beat expectations of the top line with sales of 715K, helped by both the rising price of mined uranium and also the company's recent foray into mining rare earth metals. So just wanting to point out here that the rising price in uranium is boosting these stocks and it's causing an epic bull market in these stocks. And another story that speaks to that is this one out of CNBC saying Bank of America upgrades uranium named Camco amid renewed interest in nuclear. So we have the big banks piling on with Bank of America saying the firm upgraded the stock to buy from neutral, saying shares can rally nearly 30% from current levels. Camco should benefit from strength in the metals price as nuclear power's role in decarbonization is reconsidered. So an upgrade like this from Bank of America is big because it means that the institutional investors that read their research reports are now willing to put money in if they hear that Camco has a 30% upside, which by the way means that the explorers and small cap miners in uranium have even more upside. So it gets people excited about investing in the space. So also last week, you're the COP26, which is the climate change summit from the UN, where more awareness was raised for nuclear. You have this article out of the Financial Times, COP26, day four, European Union's press leaders to include nuclear and clean energy mix 
we talked about this a little bit in a prior episode where there's a debate raging currently about whether or not to label nuclear energy as green. <clears throat> you have solar as green, you have wind as green, but once you officially label nuclear as green, that's when the big investment can come in, you know, even larger than it already is in Europe, but that's when it can really take off. And so at this conference, you have a dozen union chiefs from across Europe have pressed world leaders to factor in nuclear power as they discuss to accelerate the path to net zero emissions. COP26 is a chance for policymakers to choose emission-free energy, good jobs, and sustainable prosperity. That means choosing nuclear power as part of a balanced energy system. So you do have a big contingent in favor of nuclear. However, there is still that debate over whether or not to call it green. And on the other side of the debate, you have Germany and Belgium have long been drawing down their nuclear sectors, while nations like New Zealand and Australia have opposed classifying nuclear as a clean power source alongside renewables. They point to ballooning costs for nuclear projects in the US and UK and call the energy source a distraction and a waste of scarce resources compared with renewables like wind and solar. They're saying it's too expensive and too slow. A lot of this is being driven by a country whose energy situation has become a laughing stock worldwide, which is Germany. Most people would agree that they're in the middle of an energy crisis. This was known back on January 8 of 20. You have this opinion piece out of the New York Times, the tragedy of Germany's energy experiment. On October 1st, a German power plant just ran out of coal in latest energy shock. So a country that wants to move away from what a lot of countries agree is a clean energy source is heavily reliant on the dirtiest possible energy source, which is coal, because their renewables have failed them. And so a German utility ran out of coal for a plant, and a coal index is headed for a record after sky-high trades. So Germany is directly contributing to rising coal prices in an unsustainable situation. We'll see how long the people put up with the anti-nuclear sentiment out of Germany, but it seems like the writing is on the wall and eventually they'll come around like UK and France did. More on that debate in Europe to come, we will stay on top of it and keep posted. And staying on the macro picture for energy, <laughs> there's more shenanigans being played in the oil space. And again, the reason why oil is important is because the higher it goes, the more people are going to be driven into sustainable energies like uranium and nuclear power. And so in the United States, you have the Biden administration begging OPEC, please supply us with your fossil fuels. And you have OPEC saying, no, we're going to stick to oil production plan and they're defying US pressure. And so I love this tweet which kind of coincides directly with the article I just showed you. Breaking news, Saudi Arabia raises the official selling price of all Saudi Arabia crude to all buyers, increasing prices. This is the world's largest oil producer. So not only are they sticking it to the US saying, well, if you want oil, you know, you shut all yours down. Now you want ours. Well, we're going to raise the price on you. So all signs are leading to higher oil prices and therefore a serious demand for alternatives such as nuclear. And I love news like this because it points to the future and what we can expect from this industry. And so the first big exciting development in this space are small modular reactors. So in the midst of the COP26 climate talks, U.S. and Romania official steps aside for a session establishing an agreement for U.S. company New Scale to build a new kind of modular reactor plant. The company's plants are designed to be quickly scaled up or down based on need and are intended to be quicker and cheaper to build than the traditional kind, with some considering them promising alternatives for countries to seek to wean themselves off fossil fuels. So you have less expensive access to nuclear energy, which can be even more dispersible. So speaking on small modular reactors, here's an example. Russia is now heating homes with a floating power plant as part of an experiment to minimize climate change. Nuclear residential heating has been introduced in the Siberian town. It's providing the local residents with heat from a nearby floating power plant. Some experts say it's dangerous, but others think it could limit climate change. And I think once people enjoy local energy generation, unlimited, sustainable, clean in their area, which can fuel many operations, lots of economic activity, I think over time, people will realize the low risks of a, of a dangerous nuclear event and look at the benefits and look at the odds and say, well, obviously the risk reward here is in favor of these small modular reactors. Another example, which came out this week, is a US Air Force base 
to be first to deploy new nuclear micro reactor. Soon every town could have one. So just imagine a future where every town has a small modular reactor and gets inexpensive, clean, green energy that's safe due to really extensive regulations that keeps these things in check. I kind of think of it like airplanes, right? When there's an accident, it's devastating, but the likelihood is extremely small. It's like being hit by lightning. And obviously there's that psychological component of the fear of it. But, you know, again, you have to look at the actual odds of an event happening. And if it's statistically insignificant, you look at the reward more so than the risk. Given where regulation is going, given where investment is going, given how countries are trying to move away from forever increasing fossil fuel prices, it does seem like a possible outcome. So we're gonna stay on top of all these developments, keep you posted, and if I missed anything big that happened, then comment down below for other people to see. But stay tuned for more updates in this incredible paradigm shift that's changing the world and benefiting early stage investors that see the opportunity. This discussion is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this discussion should be taken as investment advice. Guests are not compensated for their appearance. Do not base any investment decisions on the information presented.